sing the song Sabbath Rest. Let's lift our voice and say, we set our work aside. We set our work aside. We leave our cares. We leave our cares behind on this day Sabbath rest. of Sabbath rest. Say, on this, your holy day. On this, your holy day. We come to give you praise. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I can't hear you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good, good, good. Welcome. We just want to take this opportunity. I just want to take this opportunity just to welcome you. Just feel at home safely through another week. God has protected us. God has brought us here. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father, what in heaven, we take this opportunity, Lord, to invite you in our presence. Thank you for being with us throughout the week. Thank you for the many blessings that you've blessed each one of us today. Loving Father, we pray that you may be with us. We pray, Lord, that your will may be fulfilled today. Loving Father, Bind us together with strong cords of love that can never be broken, Lord. Even for those who are watching us online, we pray, Lord, that you may be with them wherever they may be. Loving Father, may you meet their needs. We pray for the needs of all visitors, Father. Be with them too. Kindly, may you be found in them too. Loving Father, we welcome you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, once again, I just want to invite you. I just want you to feel home, you know, feel free. And for those who are watching us online too, I take this special opportunity just to welcome you, just to be with us. Uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, do the announcements. Unfortunately, this week they didn't project them up there, uh, but we'll go and do them. 
All right, uh, this weekend, you see the church is a little bit empty. You know, Master Guards went out to Arkansas for Master Guard camp, uh, Canoe Camp in Arkansas. Therefore, as they are there, just let us pray for them. Uh, empower training for Pathfinders, uh, for Pathfinder staff, Master Guide, and also TLTs will be held on Saturday, next Saturday, September 9th. Next Saturday, September 9th, Master Guide staff, uh, you know, Pathfinder staff, and also TLT. They need to be at NDAA. Next Sabbath, NDAA, they have the Empower Training. And also you may see, yeah, Empower Training. For more information, you may see uh, Pathfinder Director. That's uh, Sister, Sister Lydia Omari. Uh, Master Guide Campuri, as you know, this month and next month is kind of a little bit busy because we have Campuris back to back to back. Uh, the first one that's coming up is Master Guide. Master Guide Campuri, mark your calendar, 9th, uh, September, September 22nd, sorry, through 24th. September 22nd through the September 24th. Please see your director, Kathy. Master Guides Campuri, the 22nd of September through the 24th of September. More information, Kathy, Kathy Commando, uh, Kathy Rangi. Adventure Campuri is next. We start with Master Guide, then we go to Adventure Campuri. Adventure Campuri, we have adventures in the house. I can't hear. Adventurers? Okay, all right. Okay. The Campuri is coming up. That will be October 6th through October 8th. October 6th through October 8th. Uh, please see Sister Rose and Eric Ombane just to register for that. And then after that, Pathfinder Campuri comes up uh, October 13th through October 15th. Pathfinder Campuri, October 13th through October 15th. And remember, our registration for the Pathfinder Campuri ends this Sunday, September the 3rd. Therefore, after this Sunday, you'll be paying 50. Right now, I think we are paying 40. But after this Sunday, for registration, it will be 50 moving forward. Please, again, see Sister Lydia for more information. And then uh, we have another one coming up. Saturday, September 16th, will be World Pathfinder Day. September 16th will be World Pathfinder Day. And we'll have a full fun day of activities. Then don't miss out. And another one still, Pathfinder. Uh, you know where we're going next year, right? Can someone remind me? Where are we going next year? Not Oscos. Still Oscos. We are going to Gillette. Uh, we are going to Gillette, Wyoming. And uh, August 5 through August 11th, 2024. August 5 through August 11, 2024. We'll be in Gillette. Wyoming International Campuri. Therefore, remember, we have a few tickets left, about 38,000 left for us in the U.S. Therefore, please register ASAP or see Sister, you know, Sister Lydia Omari. And another thing, uh, I think uh, we have a charge board coming up next weekend. A charge board coming up next weekend. Therefore, at this point, I will just want to encourage you, just feel free and just know that we are in the house of the Lord. Where are the smiles? I don't see the smiles. Yes, we are in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much. Praise God. He's an awesome God. He is wonderful. He is mighty. And we just came here today to sing that our God is greater and he is stronger. He is higher than any other. 
Anybody believe that today? Anybody believe that the God you serve is greater than any other? All right, let's stand to our feet as we sing this song. Our God. Come on, it's all right to put your hands together. Celebrate a good God. Let's talk about his goodness. Water.
Bible says, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. I'm so glad I have a father who I can trust in, who I can believe every promise that he made. I don't have to worry about him going back on his word.
like a deer panted after the water.
there's a verse in Romans that I really like about prayer. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us grow in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. We can all find a place to pray. Father who art in heaven, Lord, I want to come to you this morning and intercede for everyone here today, Lord. You know what everyone is going through individually, Lord. This generation, there are many things, many temptations that we all face, Lord. And I pray that you may help us walk through those and walk through life, Lord. Please continue to be with us every step of the way. Lord, may you please help us to be firm in our faith, even though the world can sway us, Lord. I pray that if anyone is going through something individually, that you may intercede for them as well. Lord, I pray for the sick, those who are in the hospital, Lord. I pray that if it is your will, they may be saved, Lord. I pray for everyone here, Lord. I pray if someone's going through any mental challenges, that you'll intercede on their behalf, Lord. I pray that if anyone's in pain right now, if anyone's suffering, Lord, that you may speak to them, Lord. I pray that you may reveal yourself to each and every one of us today, Lord. I pray that, Pastor, that you may speak through Pastor today that the message may touch each and every one of us. Lord, I want to thank you for everything you've done in all of our lives. For we would not be here if it weren't for you, Lord. Thank you so much for everything you've done in our lives, Lord. We may not see it, but you are working in mysterious and miraculous ways, Lord. Thank you so much for everything, Lord. Lord, I pray that today we may recognize your spirit, Lord, in this building, Lord, because you are here with each and every one of us, even though we may not see it, that we may not feel it, Lord. I pray that Pastor may speak a powerful message today, Lord, that you speak through him and speak to each and every one of us, Lord. I pray for those who are struggling today with their relationship with you. I pray that you may help them grow closer to you, Lord. Thank you so much for everything you've done in our lives. And I pray that you can continue to walk with us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
precious in his hand. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Once you get your offering, you bring it. Once you get your offering, you bring it. thank you so much <laughs> you have done so well yes come on come on those who are still there bring your offering and this is the way we'll be doing it going forward okay you just go get you bring it and we put it in here thank you so much thank you Ezo. thank you oh come on come on come on all right all right happy sabbath children Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, children. Yes. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes, yes, yes. If you're happy and you know, say amen. No, no, no. You can do better. If you're happy and you know, say amen. Amen. That is so much better. Now, it's our story time, and we all love stories. I also love stories because I was told stories and I love to tell stories. So today I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible and I want you to be very attentive because I have some questions to ask you at the end. So be very attentive. Now many, 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 many years ago, God had brought the children of Israel a long, long way because he blessed them and he wanted them to be uh, his ambassadors and tell the world that who really God was, okay? And so they were um, by the Jordan River <laughs> and uh, they were occupying the land and they had dealt with uh, some tribes that were there. The first tribe was the Amorites and uh, they were not dealing with them this time. Now they were to deal with the, the Moabites. But the, the king was very afraid when he heard that the children of Israel were just around there. And uh, he was terrified that they were going to occupy their land. And so he did something very strange. Right? Um, and today we want to hear that there was an animal that spoke. A talking donkey. Right? Yes, I know you're wondering, a donkey? A talking donkey? Yes, a donkey spoke. And I'm going to show you something here. What does this look like to you? Yes, this is an angel. All right, so I'm going to put this angel here. And, and then there is an animal down here. What can you see? Can you see an animal? Yes, uh, Mama? A donkey, right? You guys can see the donkey. <laughs> and then there's, there's a man that is on the donkey. All right? Now, this man, his name is? Who? <laughs> okay. Now, the, from the Bible, no, not the cartoons that we know, from the Bible. <laughs> from the Bible, this, this, this draw you're saying is representing... Balaam. So this man, uh, the king who had, uh, I'm going to put it here. I hope you can all see. Um, I hope you can all see. Okay, I'm just going to put it here for now. Okay, you move. Now, so the king of Moab uh, was very afraid that the Israelites were going to attack them. And so he, he, he sent his servants to go and talk to Balaam, who was a man of God. This Balaam that you see up here, 
He knew who God was. And he listened to God, right? So he communicated with God like we do when we pray, when we read the Bible. We communicate with God. So he loved God. He communicated with God and he would listen to God. So he knew what. So uh, he, he, the, 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 uh, the king, the king who is, whose name was Balak, or Balak, sent his servants to go and tell Balaam to go and they cast the children of Israel. Remember the children of Israel were God's friends, right? And God had blessed them. But now, he says, I want you to go cast them. Because whatever you cast will hold. And so, when he sent his servants, and the servants told, told him what, 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 what the king had said, now Balak had to think, Balaam ba, 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 had to think and see whether he was really going to cast the children of Israel. Do you think he was ready to go and cast them? Do you think he was ready to go and cast them? No, he said, no, I'm not just going to cast them. You guys sleep. You've come today. I'm going to let you sleep tonight, and I'm going to ask the Lord what he wants me to do. That was a smart thing to do, right? Before you do anything, what do you do? You ask the Lord whether he wants you to do it. Of course, God didn't want him to go cast them. So he listened to God that night. And at night, he got a message from God. And God said, you are not going to curse those children of Israel. Because I have blessed them and they are my children. Okay. So what do you think, Balaam, when he woke up in the morning, what did he do? What did he do? What do you think he did the following morning? What did he do? Go and go to the children and not curse them. <laughs> okay, he saved them by not going to curse them. <laughs> That's true. So, <laughs> he, he told them, I listened to the Lord last night. Guys, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go with you. I'm not going to curse them. The Lord said no. So, they went back and told the king, hey, king, we are sorry. We talked to Balaam and he said he can't come and curse the children of Israel because uh, the Lord spoke to him. Balak was very upset. He said, what? He needs to come and cast them. And so he sent another group again, more people to go and speak to Balaam again. So when he sent them, he came, they came to him and they told him, hey, the king has said, please go and, and come with us because he needs to go and cast the children of Israel. And he said he's going to give you a handsome gift. How many love gifts? How many love gifts? I do too. Would you have gone if you were uh, if you were Balaam? If you are going to get a very handsome gift, would you have gone? Would you have gone, Samuel? Would you have gone? Yeah, <laughs> yes, I probably would have gone. A handsome, a handsome gift. But Balaam said, "No, no, 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 no. I'm going to listen to the Lord one more time. You guys sleep here tonight. I will listen to the Lord. I'll give you an answer in the following morning. And that was a smart thing to do too." Because he listened to the Lord. So he went at night, slept. Again, he got a message the mo at night that he's not supposed to go with them. But when morning came, uh, he, he, he said, okay. Uh, he said, said, you know what, I, I, I can go with them. Because the angel of the Lord said, okay, you can go with them. Yes, you can go with them. I have agreed. Go with them this time. Second time, go with them. But you'll only say what I tell you to say, all right? So he went, and, uh, and he went with them. He, he saddled his donkey. <laughs> he saddled his donkey and joined these other servants and went with them. They started going. But God was not happy. God was not happy because God didn't want him to go to meet this king that was wicked, right? Because he wanted him to curse the children of Israel. But all the same, he went. And as they were going, he reached a place where the angel of the Lord obstructed him. The angel was right there in front. And what do you think the angel did? Standing here, could the donkey go through the angel? No, the donkey could not go. But Balak was not, Balaam was not seeing. He was not seeing the angel, but the, the donkey was seeing the angel. You see that? And what do you think they, uh, happened? So the donkey couldn't go through here. 
I'm trying to hold it up. The donkey couldn't go through the angel, couldn't go around. But Balak was not seeing. So then what happened? The donkey just stood there. He couldn't go forward because there, there, there was an obstacle. And then what do you think Balak did? Balaam did, sorry. What do you think Balaam did? Yes. He hit it. He hit it so hard. And then he hit the donkey. And the donkey, you know, couldn't go beyond that. And then, uh, you know, the donkey moved, uh, moved, moved, moved to the side and tried again to move to the another side so that he could go through. So this time again, has he, the donkey moved to the other side. The angel was still also there again. And what do you think ba Balaam did? What do you think he did? He hit, yes. What did you think he did? Yes, he hit it again. Donkey, donkey. I'm sorry, my donkey's falling. <laughs> he hit it again. And then, again, the, he, the, the donkey couldn't go beyond. You know, he couldn't go uh, through the angel because there was an obstacle. And then now the third time came. There was still the angel. And the donkey was supposed to go again through. But the donkey could not go again. So what happened? It just went down. And, 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 and just laid down with Balaam on top of the donkey. So what do you think again Balaam did? He hit it again. This is how, the, how many, the third time. He hit it again so hard. And then now, something miraculous happened. The Lord opened the donkey's mouth. Now, the donkey was speaking. The donkey spoke, all right? And these are the words that the, the, the donkey spoke. The donkey said, the donkey said these words. Okay? Um, the donkey said these words. When the angel of the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, the donkey said this. Um, why, uh, what have I done? This is, the, this is the donkey asking. What have I done to you to make you beat me three times. What have I done? All right? And then Balaam said, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword, I would kill you right now. Oh, my goodness. That is, uh, if, you were, if Balaam was here, that would have been animal what? <laughs> animal abuse, right? Yeah. So the donkey spoke. And imagine now, Balaam is talking to the donkey. They're having a conversation with the donkey. Which was the bigger donkey? Which was the bigger donkey? He's speaking with the donkey. And then again the donkey said, Am I not your own donkey which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in a habit of doing this to you? Every time he wrote it. Right? And then he said, No. He said, No. But the angel of the Lord opened his eyes. You see now, the eyes were closed. The eyes were closed. Now the angel of the Lord opened his eyes, and now he had a conversation with the angel. The angel asked, why were you beating your donkey? The donkey was seeing what you were not seeing, because what you were going to do was not right, and God was not happy with you. And so Balaam said, I am so sorry. Then I can go back. He said, no, you don't have to go back. You can go with these people, but only speak that which that I tell you to speak. Again, the angel of the Lord told him that. So what is the moral of our story today? What is the moral of our story today? Yes. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, really quick. We don't have much time. To listen to what God tells us. Very good. To listen to what God tells us. Yes. Come on, come on, come on. If you, you speak, you really come up really quick. To the words of God and don't use your tongue. To listen, sorry, to listen to the words of God and do what God said. And God can be very unhappy with us when we do things that He doesn't want us to do. Yes, Hannah. <laughs> don't beat animals. Yes, yes, that's true. Don't beat animals. That is animal abuse. Yes, you are the last one. 
Be patient with people, all right? And be patient with the animals as well. So may God help us that we may listen to the voice of God. And before we do anything, we should always ask God what he wants us to do, okay? All right, so that's the end of our story today. Somebody's playing. No, 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 no. All right, so we're going to, to pray together, and then we're going to go back. Who's ready to pray? I just want one person to pray for us. Okay, come on, come on, real quick. And I brought my donkey and my angel. Come on. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. I hope you have a good day. Today is a good day. We hope you learn something from this turkey story. I hope you can bless everybody in this world to be safe and able to be safe in this world. And the God will go to church and everybody is well safe today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you again for the children's moment. Lord, we pray that we may be sensitive to what you tell us to do each and every day. And above all, oh Father, we pray that you may bless us and remember us in your soon coming kingdom. Bless each and every child that is here now and forevermore. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go back to your parents and be good kids. to receive gifts and a lot of attention on their birthdays. Have you ever thought about ways of thanking God for his goodness during this day? Juliana wanted to make soup for people experiencing homelessness on her special day. However, her mother was hesitant, stating that making soup was costly and arduous, and they didn't have a large enough pot to feed many people. So after praying about it, she decided to ask her neighbors if she could borrow a big soup pot. After obtaining enough pots, she went to the nearest grocery store and asked the manager if they could donate some vegetables for the soup. The manager gave her one bag of vegetables and other stores also donated bags of ingredients for the soup. Juliana beamed joyful as she showed her bags of food and the pots to her mother. The next day, she invited some of the ladies from the church and they made a lot of soup together. On the day of Juliana's birthday, they finished making the soup and drove to town to meet with the homeless and hungry people. After Juliana announced that it was her birthday and that she made soup for them, they cheered and sang happy birthday to her. After this, Juliana's mom began attending church with her, and several months later, she asked Jesus into her heart. Today, Juliana, her mother, and several other church members feed the homeless twice a month. As God is the creator and sustainer of life, it is to him that glory, honor, thanksgiving, and gifts are due on birthdays. But how can you put God first during your next birthday? You may use this opportunity to renew your vows of seeking Him first every day of the coming year by praying, studying the Bible, and the Sabbath school lesson. You may also honor Jesus this day by forgiving someone, reflecting His love and service for others, or bringing Him a birthday offering in addition to your tithe and promise offering. You may renew your vows of keeping the Sabbath better, taking care of your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and returning an honest tithe to Him. During our birthdays or on any other day, may we always put our desires last and God first. Happy Sabbath. Okay, so as our deacons and our deaconesses go around with the baskets, uh, I just want to remind you guys that that's not our only way of giving. I'm sure they'll put it up on the screen soon. But you can also give through Cash App and Zelle and through the Adventist website. And there's going to be a tutorial on how you can do that after this. But uh, first, I want to tell you guys a story. So when I was a kid, we used to do the children's story money collection, right? And you'd have the cups, and you'd go around, and they'd put money in there. And one time, I had just gotten a new piggy bank at home, and I was like, hmm, 
what if I take a quarter from here and I go home and I put it in my piggy bank? Nobody will notice, right? And as I was about to do that, I remember the story my dad told me. It was a true story. It was about how a guy, one time he stole money from the church and his life went downhill. He lost his wife. He lost his job. So I was like, oh my goodness, if I take this quarter, God's going to put my family on the streets. He's going to kill my parents. I'm going to have no money or no food for the rest of my life. So I didn't take the quarter. But I think when we get older, sometimes we forget that when we don't give tithe, it's almost like we're stealing. Because at the end of the day, we're not giving money to God. We're returning what he's already given us. So, and I know everybody's like, um, give 10%, give 10%. But just because you don't want to give 10% doesn't mean you give nothing, right? Like, God would prefer you give $10 with a smile on your face than if you give $1,000. Like, oh my goodness, now I got to give tithe because pastor told me to. God doesn't want that because he wants you to be happy with your giving because he was happy when he gave it to you. So as the video plays, I just want to challenge you guys to put a little money in there, put some change from your wallet, because at the end of the day, every penny counts. An input field where you can type the name of your church. Once you begin typing the name of the church, a drop down menu will appear with a short list of churches that best match your entry. It is very important that you select the correct church. One way to verify if you have the correct church is by the address shown. Once you select the church, you will be taken to the donation page that resembles the familiar tithe envelopes you see in church each week. Here, you will see the areas that you can choose to designate your monies for, such as tithe, local church budget, Sabbath school expenses, etc. The virtual envelope is separated by sections for local church, conference and union, and world. At the bottom of each section, you will see the phrase more offering categories. Here, you can click and a pop-up window will display a list of other options for you to select to add to your virtual tithe envelope. Once you are done, you click the Back to Envelope button. Once you make your selections of where you want to donate, you input the amount next to the dollar symbol by each specific area. If you choose more than one category, it will automatically total your donation at the bottom of the page. Once you are finished designating your funds, click Continue. This will take you to the next page, where you will have the option to log in, register, or continue as a guest to make your donation. We recommend registering if you are a first-time user. That way, your profile information and payment will be saved to make it easier for future use. The second method you can give online is through the Adventist Giving app via your smartphone. First, you must download the Adventist Giving app from the App Store or Google Play. Once you do, open the app. The initial page will tell you more about Adventist giving and the features of the app. You will be prompted to slide to the right until you see the option to select your church. Once you select your church, you will see the options with the same sections and categories as the website. The main difference is that at the top, just below your listed church, you will see the option for a one-time donation or a recurring donation, which you can select to set up automatic payments. Follow the instructions and input where you would like your monies to go, and the total will be automatically calculated at the end, just like the website. Continue to follow the instructions listed and you will be on your way to successfully donate it via the ease of your smartphone. Okay. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for everybody who gave today. Thank you for all the money that we have here. And please bless those who gave. I pray that you also bless those who didn't give. So next time when they have the opportunity, they're able to return the blessings that you've given them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A happy Sabbath. A happy Sabbath. We, before we continue with our service here, and I just want to welcome you again. 
into our service. We have an important service that we need to do here, and that is of baby dedication or child dedication here. We want to take a few moments and do this important part of the service, child dedication. Now, I want to invite the families who are here, the family of um, Jace Momanyi and Luke Andege. They want to dedicate these children before the Lord, and they requested they want to dedicate them together. So that's a wonderful, their family, and they want to dedicate them together. So I want to invite them here as we do this, um, Jace Momanyi um, um, and Luke Andege. Now, um, I know we have families who have come along to support them, you know. Um, so the parents, as they come forward, I want to invite you to come forward here. Um, and if there are any family that just came specifically to support. So we have Jesse Momani, the dad, Lamek Masese, and Purity um, Keraro. Then we have Luke. Luke Andege, Jared Momani, and Nancy Asiago. If you came specifically, we want to dedicate them together here before the Lord. I will ask at one point to invite the elders um, to come when we do prayer of dedication. Allow me to say a few things as we dedicate Jace and Luca Andege today. Now, baby dedication. Baby dedication is biblical, and the reason why we do this in baby dedication is recognizing, number one, children are a gift from God. As a parent, you are a steward of your children. The children belong to God. That's number one. They belong to God, and that means that as they grow up, these children remember that as all of us, we fall short of the glory of God. They can only be saved by Christ. Dedicating them, we are saying that we want to commit these children before the Lord so that they can grow to know and to love God. But this is what I want to say to you today. Parents. Dedication is useless if the parents don't dedicate themselves to the Lord. I want to repeat it again. Baby dedication, as we dedicate these wonderful children, it will be of no use if you parents don't dedicate yourself to the Lord because they will grow to know the Lord to the extent that you teach them about God. That you live your life reflecting God. So baby dedication really, number one, is parents dedicating themselves before the Lord. And then number two, we ask that by the grace of God as you dedicate these children, that God will give you wisdom on how to raise them so that they can know the Lord. But we pray upon the Spirit of God that as they grow up, that they will be inclined to know and to love the Lord. So, let me ask you here today. I usually take this very seriously. The Bible reminds us, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7. You must commit yourself wholeheartedly to the commands, which means to the word of God. The Bible says you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord. Then he says, repeat the words of God to your children. Repeat them, teach them, whatever you are. The Bible says, repeat them again and again. Talk to them when you are at home. Talk to them when you're on the road. Talk to them when you're in bed. Talk to them when you're getting up. He says, everywhere you are, use it as an opportunity to teach them the word of God. Let me ask the parents today, because I like to make this as a covenant. It's serious. And if it's your desire, you say, yes, you do. 
Do you here this day recognize that your child is a gift of God? Do you here this day dedicate your children to the Lord and give them to the Lord? Do you here this day promise to give your children every possible benefit of home, of education, and of church? Do you, do, do you here this day ask for God's blessings upon your children to guide, God to guide, to guard, and to direct your children through all the years as they live? Do you? Now, I'm doing this because, as I said again, baby dedication, it is you parents dedicating yourself to the Lord. So I pray that even after this baby dedication, I will invite the children leader to welcome you, but it's my prayer that I will be seeing you and the children every Sabbath as you bring them before the Lord as we dedicate them today. At this point, Allow me to invite the elders to come forward, please, as we dedicate um, Jace and Luca before the Lord. All right. I may not be able to hold all of them, but I'll just lay hands on one of the elders, if you can do the same, please. And surround Please, I will ask another mic. Um, I would allow me you pray um, for Jace, and I will pray for um, Luca. Go ahead, let's pray. Let's pray. Our loving Father, what in heaven, we just want to thank you for Jace. We thank you for the gift of life for Jace. We thank you for the parents. Loving Father, we come before thee, thanking them, Lord, for recognizing, Lord, that you are the giver of them, Lord. And they're bringing them back to thee just to de de dedicate them, Lord. Dear Lord, be with Jace as he's growing up, Lord. May you engulf him with your love. Protect him, Lord. Continually, Lord, walk with him, Lord. Father, may you bring out the purpose of which you created him, Lord, to honor and glorify you. Loving Father, with the parents, we pray, Lord, that you may give them the wisdom and the know-how. Even as a church community, we pray, Lord, that help us, Lord, to bring them up in a way that's pleasing to thee. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn, O Father who is in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to commit these children to your care. Father, we recognize that with our own strength, Lord, we cannot be able to raise them in a manner that is pleasing before you. And so, Father, in this simple act that we have come by faith, trusting, Lord, that as we seek your help, Lord, you will come through for these parents. I pray that, Heavenly Father, that you will grant them wisdom, as the Bible says, if anyone lacks of wisdom, let him ask of the Lord. Father, I pray that you give these parents wisdom, on how to raise Jace and Luca in the way that is pleasing before you, O God. But as we dedicate them, Lord, I want to dedicate these parents in your hands, O God, that you will fill them with your spirit, draw them close to you, O God, and may they surrender their lives to you every day. Father, fill them with your presence so that as they raise these children, they will know and they will see an example of Jesus through them. Father who is in heaven, bless them. Bless them in a special way. Every challenge that they face, every struggle that they face, every concern that they have. Father, we pray that you give them grace, give them strength, and Lord, give them victory in raising these children. And now, Heavenly Father, I commit Luke into your care and ask you, God, that your will will be done upon him, Heavenly Father. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. Guide his life, O oh God. And we ask that as he grows up, that he will never depart from your presence. Father who is in heaven, even as a church, we ask that give us grace and give us a heart of willing to support these families, O oh God. Father, to encourage them, 
Father, to be there for them when they need us, O God. Father, to instruct them wherever we can. I pray, O God, that you will help us, Lord, as a church, that we can unite together to support this family, to raise these children to know you, O God. And now we ask, O God, for your blessing, for your anointing upon Lucas, upon Jace. Lord, cover them with your precious blood of Jesus and watch over them. May they grow to please you, to honor you, to glorify you, O God. In the end, Lord, when you come, may they be found to be faithful in your presence. We thank you today. May your, may your name be glorified, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hold on. We haven't finished. I want to, um, I want to present this to um, Luca. Um, and I want to say, keep this certificate. I usually say it's the most important certificate more than the degree they will get. Because you remind them they were dedicated, they belong to God. This certificate, keep it. Remind them as they grow that they were dedicated to the Lord. I want to invite Audije so that he, she can give you an official welcome into the fellowship and the children ministry. Thank you, Pastor. It's my honor and privilege to welcome uh, Luca Masese Ndege and Jez Asiago Momani to the children's department. Amen. Welcome. <laughs> we are so happy to have you, Jez. So happy to have you, Luca. And we look forward to fellowshipping together, playing together, and learning together. My question is to you, and you don't have to answer. I don't know how old they are. But how many times have they been to their class? All right. So that is a question for you to answer. But welcome. It's a joy to have you. And we look forward to fellowshipping together. I'm going to give you this gift. There is a book in here. Please read and, uh, and, 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 and share. Here, 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 here. That's for Jace. Thank you so much. And may God bless you as we uh, fellowship together going forward. Thank you so much, Pastor, for the moment. Thank you. And may God bless you. song simply says that he's going to do it again. I 
I know the night won't last. Your word would come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness, oh God. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You'll never fail me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. Never will. I've seen you move, you move the mountain, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you move the mountain. It's time for scripture reading.
Happy Sabbath. Uh, the scripture comes from chapter 2, verse 14 to 26, and it says, What does it profit, profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked in, and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he was offered when he offered Isaac his son to the altar? Do you see the faith that was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for, for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Thank you for um, that beautiful reading, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here and worship the Lord. I want to welcome you into our worship service here. Uh, we have a number of visitors who are visiting with us. I'm glad you are here. Glad to see you. Glad to have an opportunity to fellowship with you. Um, so you are very, very welcome. Some of them I have i um, seen them before, and some, they're new. So if you're a visitor, please, where you are, could you just uh, wave to us? I feel like we need to recognize visitors here. Please, visitors, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I can see um, uh, Dr. Duff in there with James and Madam President, as we call you, uh, uh, Rose, and welcome together. Um, uh, from Minnesota, right? <laughs> yes, 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 welcome here. I know that we, uh, some of our members are not here, but we just want to welcome, welcome, thank you, thank you everyone for being here and those who are watching online. Take a few moments to go into the Word of God, and uh, before we do that, let's just have a word of prayer. Father who is in heaven, as we take a moment just to reflect on your Word, we ask that Heavenly Father, that may you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, I pray that as we take this moment, Lord, open our hearts to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. We ask that you be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to talk about saving and non-saving faith. That, that means that uh, from the title alone, it means that there is faith that actually saves and there is faith that does not save. What is clear is that there is faith. Faith is involved. We can have faith, but we can have faith that saves, and we can have faith that does not save. So the question that probably I want to raise here today is, which kind of faith do you have? Because at the end of this preaching, we need to re-examine ourselves. The Bible says, examine, test yourself and examine yourself, put a microscope on your life, and then when you do that, ask yourself, does the faith that you have, is it faith that actually saves you, or faith that does not save you? Let me ask a question. Complete that sentence. 
if you are given an assignment, <laughs> and I would say complete that sentence, what will you put there? Some of you want to say nice words, and some of you don't really want to say nice words. But if you are real, <laughs> and you are completing this sentence, stop putting on the spiritual Holy Sabbath look. I want you to complete this sentence, maybe the way you have heard it, or maybe the way you speak it. So let me hear it. If you were to complete this sentence... What words could you use? Most Christians are fake. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, yes. Pretenders, ignorant, <laughs> hypocrite. Oh my goodness. No one is giving anybody grace here. <laughs> Unfaithful. All right, hold on. Is this church? <laughs> Because I'm not hearing anything positive right away. But so if, if you were finishing this sentence here, what will you say? Biased? <laughs> Faithful? Okay, somebody at least is trying to, you know. <laughs> we, we're trying to bat a little bit, you know. It's, it's, it's not all down here, right? Genuine? All right, let me hear young people. Let me hear somebody, young people. Young people. No, 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 not the, not the young at heart. No, young, young at heart and age. All right, L let me hear some of the responses. What, what will you say? Most Christians are kind. Okay, good. Not saved. <laughs> oh, amen. We need, we need to stay revival here. What will you say? Most Christians are? Huh? Loving, okay. Fake, okay. Huh? Respectful, all right. Not confused. Oh. <laughs> I have heard. <laughs> I have heard every adjective that you can think about Christians. Now, the question that I'm asking myself, if you are feeling this most Christians are, maybe you expect some people to say they should be steadfast, maybe slow to anger, or, you know, dwarves of the word, or maybe involved in ministry or non-judgmental, because there is a connotation that comes with the word Christian, right? So, so where is... This kind of dichotomy where we have these adjectives. Most Christians are. How is it supposed to be? Now, I was reading a book called Unchristian. The book called Unchristian is research. They found out that 84% of non-Christians they say they know a Christian personally. They know a Christian personally. Now, hear me well. 84% of non-Christians say they know a Christian personally. Yet, when being asked about these Christians and their lifestyle... Only 15% said that those believers are noticeably different in a good way. All right, let me put it clear. 84% of non-Christians, they know a Christian, but only out of the 84, only 15% said that their life is noticeably, what? In a good way. That means majority of us, how we present ourselves, 
not only inside here, but outside there, does not reflect who we call ourselves we are. In fact, a study by Banner Group asked non-Christians about their perceptions of Christians and they found out this when they asked about their perception of Christians, non-Christians. 87% said Christians were judgmental. 85% said Christians were hypocritical. 78% said Christians were out of touch. That doesn't look good, does it? So, I'm asking myself, this discrepancy that we have, this discrepancy that we have about what we profess and who we, we are and how we live our life where does the, where does the, the, that discrepancy come about? Now, how do people handle this discrepancy? Some of them would say, you know, they change their beliefs. You know, they'll say people witness they are hypocrites in the church, you know, and another Christian will say, you know what, I'm out. Forget it, I'm out. You know, others will say, you know what, let's compartmentalize this compartmental Christianity. How do they do it? You know, when you are in church, we are in church. When you are not in church, God is not in church. So you live your life when you are in church as one thing, but outside you live something else. So that they, when they see you, they don't see what they see. You profess to know God, to believe in God. James brings us in the book of James, chapter 2. He speaks about practical Christianity. If you read in chapter 1 of the book of James, and I will encourage you to actually find it as a devotion book to read it. Because they say the book of James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. It talks about practical Christianity. You know, there's, it's, not, it's every day what you need. How do you live your life? Practical Christianity. That's why if you read chapter 1, it will tell you about religion that is worthless. And he says, if you are religious, but your religion does not help you in what you speak, is useless what comes out of your mouth. You know, if you cannot tame it, whatever you speak, speaks about who you know, or your religion, whether it's worthless or not. So here, Paul, I mean, I mean, in the book of James, he speaks about three kinds of faith. We have dead faith, we have demonic faith, and then we have saving faith. My goal that as we do this is to get to the place of saying, what is the saving faith? Because the only reason we are here is we have faith that is going to save you. What point is it to profess to have faith? Go to church, stay there, you know, many years, and then later on realize, you know what? It wasn't even faith that will save you. Our profession. Does it go in line with possession? Give you a story. Tony Campolo gives a story when he, he was working. He's an evangelist. When he was walking down the streets of Philadelphia, you know, turning around a corner, it was kind of dark a little bit, he found robbers. So these robbers, they came to him and they were robbing him. Now, Tony Campolo, as an evangelist, a minister, thought to himself, Perhaps let me just speak and remind them that I'm a minister of the gospel. At least maybe they will feel guilty from stealing from a pastor. So, so he told the robbers, please, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm a Baptist minister. Then the robbers, one of them said, really? You're a minister? You're a Baptist? He said, yes, I'm a Baptist minister. So one of the robbers said, I'm a Baptist too. But he didn't stop robbing him. He said, you're a Baptist minister. I'm a Baptist too. 
but they continued to rob him whatever he had. And I asked myself, what difference did it make for the robber who was a Baptist <laughs> and robbing a Baptist minister and claiming I'm still a Baptist? You have heard it before. Who are you? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Maybe you find it at work, or maybe you find it, you know, along your friends, and you say, well, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. But they will also say, oh, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, which church do you go? Well, it's been a while. You know, it's been a while since I went to church. It's been a while since I visited. You know, it's been a while. I can't remember the last time, but I'm what? But I'm a seven-day Adventist. In your mind, what do you ask? What do you think about them? <laughs> You're asking your profession of seven-day Adventist and an Adventist does not make any difference at all in the way you live, in the way you act, in whatever you do. So James comes here and asks the question. You know, if you turn with me to the book of um, James chapter 2 and verses 14. He says here, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go in peace, warm and, well, and be well fed, does, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? The question I'm asking here He's speaking about dead faith. Dead faith is the one that says, my brother, I will pray for you. My sister, I will pray for you. <laughs> Somebody tells you, listen, I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling even to put gas in my car. And you know what you say? Oh, you know, it is tough. It is tough out here. You know very well that you have $1,000, you have $2,000, you have $5,000, but you saying to you, I don't have gas at all. And you say, you know what? It is tough. But you know what? I'm going to do what? I'm going to pray for you. Let me tell you, some of you are misused to that prayer. We just throw it just to pass on, you know, the guilt in you so that you don't look non-Christian, you don't look concerned. So what do you do? You just speak up and just throw it. Jeremy says that kind of faith is dead. It's not helping. Faith that only says, I'll pray for you, I'll do this for you, I'll do this for you, that has no actions. He says that's a dead faith. In other words, it's like you don't have faith at all. Now, I went through a few people who talk about faith without action. One of them says, faith is just believe in action. Head knowledge becomes faith once it's acted upon in obedience. Faith alone without action, the Bible says, is what? It's dead. We can talk about being Christians. We can talk about believing God. We can talk about knowing God. But if there's no action that is involved to show your faith is dead. I looked on the Hebrews 11 when you Look at the Hall of Fame. The Bible calls them the Hall of Fame. People of faith, the Hall of Faith. And do you realize how those men and women are being spoken there? The Bible says, Abel brought an offering. He did not sit down. An action. Abel brought an offering. The Bible will say, Noah built an ark. Noah didn't just sit there and say, you know what, guys? The Lord has said the rain will come. I just believe the rain will come. Let's just sit here and wait. The Bible said, Noah built an ark. Faith and action. Even though it was not raining at all, but he believed God and he acted on the word of God. Number two, Abram, the Bible says, did what? Left, not sitting down, left. And when he was asked to offer Isaac, the Bible says, he offered, he took Isaac, put in the altar, raised up his knife, and then God said, hold on. But there was an action, faith in action. Well, Sarah, the Bible says, trusted God. Sarah trusted God. No, just, you know, trusted God. The Bible says, Jacob 
did what? Blessed his sons. Joseph instructed, Moses chose, Rahab welcomed. There's always an action that involves the profession of faith. Follow with me. If you don't live it, you don't what? Believe it. If you don't live it, you don't believe it. There's a phrase I'm trying to remember which says, if it walks like what? A duck. And that's what? Quacks like what? Then it's what? Then it's a duck. It is important for us to understand here. And I'm bringing this to you so that I ask the question, how is your faith? You cannot tell me that the way you speak, the way you dress, the way you act, and when you profess about Christ, has to be, your faith has to be seen. It's not an intellectual knowledge. It has to be seen. You cannot say, I love the Lord, and you've never opened the word of God. You cannot say, you know, I am, I am committed to God, but you don't read the word of God. Nothing. That faith is dead. It's not faith that is alive. No man can come to Christ by faith. And remain the same anymore that he can come into contact with a 200-fold wire and remain the same. That's Warren who says so. Faith has to kind of give you an electric jolt. That means there must be an action that is involved. A person who professes Christ but who does not live a Christ-honoring, Christ-obeying life is what? Is a fraud. Or maybe let me keep going. Faith alone justifies. Calvin will say so. But the faith that justifies is never alone. That means you have faith, but, that, but faith alone <laughs> justifies you. Salvation. But faith alone cannot be, cannot be alone. Then, this is another part. If Satan can get someone to think that he will get into heaven, because of his many good deeds, apart from faith in Christ, he's perfectly content to watch that person devote his entire life to good works. Remember this. Some of us, we believe we are saved by good works, which is wrong. We are saved by faith, but we are saved for works. We are not saved by works. We are saved for works. We are not saved. We are saved by faith alone. But faith does not still remain alone. Second part, two people who are lost. One says, I go to heaven by good works. You know, that means, I'm, God, I'm doing the right thing. I'm just doing the right thing. I'm going to go to heaven. Says, uh-uh, you're not saved by works. But the other one says, oh, if a person who was born and raised in the church thinks, I'm going to heaven because I believe in Jesus as my Savior. But his faith is merely intellectual and it does not affect his daily life. Satan is happy with such false faith. What am I saying to you, my brothers and sisters? I'm saying to you today, dead faith is one that has no actions involved. Dead faith is one that does not affect how you live. One day, you know, when I was driving the electric car, the, the Prius, I came home. And I was a little tired, parked in the garage. And you know, sometimes when you drive electric cars, there's, there's a time you don't, you don't hear nothing. You, you hear nothing because the car is on, but you hear nothing. So I came, parked it there. My mind told me the car is off. I, I went out, went to the house, left it. It ran for a whole day. The following day, I did not get out. <laughs> I was home all day, but the car ran for a whole day without me knowing that the car was on. How did I know? Until I went there, then I realized, you know what? Why is the dashboard looks like it is lighting on? When I was leaving, I forgot about everything else. My mind was all over the place, and I forgot about everything else. It's the same thing. When you have an electric car packed, the car can be on, but no one knows the car is on. 
How do we know that the car is on? Until you get in, you start driving, then you realize what? Actually, the car is on. You cannot tell from the outside if the car is on, if there's no noise. Or maybe let me use an illustration. You know, back home, there is, there is a way we knew that it was lunchtime. There is a way we knew it was lunchtime. Now, forget about, <laughs> forget about the electric cookers and, and everything else. And, you know, just take your mind back home in that small kitchen where you usually cook food from, right? Now, as you prepare food, the only way to know, some of us when we were young and far away in the field and, you know, busy playing, we always did know exactly when food is being prepared. But there's always a sign that we looked for. In the morning when there's nothing, breakfast is done, kitchen is whatever is done, you will look at the house, everything is okay. But when time comes along, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, somewhere there, we'll look and we'll see smoke. Now, smoke coming out of the house was an indication that something is doing what? Is happening in the house. So from the moment of smoke, we'll time ourselves. You know, wait a little bit <laughs> so that we hang 30 minutes, maybe, maybe 45. So by the time we come, we knew from the time we saw the smoke, by now, when we get home, it might be time for what? For lunch. If there was no smoke, we kept wondering, what's going on? No one is doing anything. But the moment we saw the smoke was an indication there was fire and something was being prepared for us to eat. It's the same case. Faith, you will never know what is being cooked until you see the smoke. Jeremy says here to you and says to me, faith does not, that does not involve behavior that is seen is dead. But also, if you say, well, yes, we, we, we know, we have faith. We are Christians, we have faith. James will say, the second part, dead faith. Dead faith is the one which says, my brother will pray for you, my sister will pray for you. But also he says here, there's another faith that I call the demon faith, the demonic faith. Now, now we, 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 don't, we don't like to refer that kind of faith to us because, no, who wants to be close to the devil? But, 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 but look what he says here. What does he say? If, if you say that you have faith, he says, even the devil, the, devil's, the, devil, the devil knows, the devil knows that there is faith, but he also says, not only there is faith, but the Bible says the devil trembles. Many of us, we don't think that the devil knows God. But I want to tell you, the devil knows God very well, and the Bible says, not only knowing God, but the devil does what? Trembles. This is the second faith. Faith, but has emotions. Are we, getting, are we together? Dead faith says, thank you very much. Move on. I'll pray for you. Second faith, which is the devil faith. The Bible says the devil knows God, but he still trembles. That means there's a sense of emotions that are involved. There's fear that is involved. Now, this is the faith that says this. You hear a concern, and then you say, well, yeah, that's really bad. Actually, it affects you somehow. But then, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Oh, pastor is preaching. You hear the word of God, and then you say, well, I really need to start thinking. I really, you feel convicted, or maybe they're doing tithes and offering. You say, I have faith that God will bless me, and I have faith that God, you know, wants us to give. And I'm committed. I really want to give. And you feel bad that you haven't been giving, you know? But, but you know God says, yeah, giving is okay, but you feel bad that you're not giving. And just, you know, something tells you, you, you really need to give. But then, that's the end of the story. After feeling bad, do you change? No, you don't say, you know what, I feel bad about it, so let me do what? Let me actually do something about it. That is the demonic faith. 
And I want to admit that most of us, we are in that category. We are not completely out of faith. But we have faith. We know God. It affects us. But does not change how you behave. Does not change how you act. It's still faith that is not saving. And James will remind you, this is faith that regrets but does not repent. This is faith that he regrets. Oh, yeah, I regret doing that. But guess, you, guess what? You regret, you go back and do the same thing that you regretted about. There's no change of behavior. Or this is the faith that can just cry. But it will cry after you wipe your tears. Nothing happens different. We cry. You come, you cry. God, I've been moved. You know, my heart, that's, not, that's wrong, God. But when we finish service here, you go home. Guess what happens? You go back to the same thing again. Faith that weeps, but does not change. Oh, the faith that says, I feel bad that I'm not involved in church activity. Oh, a good one. I, you know, I feel bad that I'm late all the time to church. I really want to be there. Sabbath school, I want to be there at 9.30. I'm late. I feel bad every day. Every time they tell me we need to be church, I need to be Sabbath school. I feel bad that I'm not there. You know I need to be there Sabbath school. But guess what happens? Sabbath comes. There is nothing you have adjusted to it. There is no adjustment that you make in terms of preparation. You don't say, well, let me examine myself. What makes me late, actually? Is it because I wake up late, or is it because I don't prepare on Friday, or is it because it's faith that is, has an emotional component of it, but does not change who you are? Jeremy says, if you have faith that is dead, or if you have demonic faith, he says that faith will not save you. It's not faith that is taking us to heaven. But then, he talks about dynamic faith. And he gives an example of dynamic faith. Faith that saves. He gives an example. Maybe some of us will say, Abraham. Now, as I was thinking through, I thought of Abraham and I thought of this man. Think about it. The Bible says in Genesis, when you read Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to move to a place that I will show you. Abraham had no idea, but he believed God. What did he do? He took his family. Let me ask a question here today. If God communicated to you today that you need to move from U.S. and go for a mission in Honduras, how many of us will say, you know what, God? I believe in you. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to leave everything, and I'm going to move to Honduras. Let me tell you. That is when your faith will end. The moment you hear Honduras, <laughs> you say, God, I love you. God, I have faith. But that this faith cannot, is not enough to propel me to sell my house because I don't know life in Honduras. All I know is in the U.S. Now, oh, maybe the Bible says here, Abram heard the word of God. He knew the covenant of his son. And he knew God would fulfill. But he didn't question God. The Bible says he had faith. God had a covenant in, with God. God had a covenant with Abram. I will give you a son. But when he heard the command of God, he said, you know what, God? I, I am going to obey you. Faith in God that made him to move. Let me ask an important question. Maybe it's a personal question. When you say you have faith in God and you put God first, think about your life. When it comes to career and comes to having faith in God, does God come first? It's a challenging question that I bring forth because that's living faith. When you tell your children, maybe parents, put God first, right? We know how to say that. When you tell them, put God first. God knows how to put a test every time that there is a faith involved. 
then he gives you a choice tomorrow. Either to put him first or to put your career first. Then he gives you a choice whether to put your sports first or to put God first. Then he gives you a test whether to put God first in your finance or to put yourself first. You say, I put God first. But let me ask you in an honest question. If your children and those who see you and what you do, will they say that you put God first? I've given my story here at some point, you know, when I was in high school. And then this teacher decided, you know what? I, you have to do the test on, Friday, on Saturday. And I was like, you know what? I don't know about that because <laughs> it's not the teacher's faith. I knew where my faith had brought me from. I knew the time that my dad would come to church because I went to Sabbath and pick me from church to go home, beat me because I went to church, and I was committed that I would keep the Sabbath. So when I went to high school, my faith was nobody, nobody will tell me otherwise when it comes to obeying God. And I remember the teacher saying, you will do this test on Sabbath. I had to stand up and say, do I put God first or do I put my test first? I told him, I will not do it. He said, that's up to you. If you want to fail, that's up to you. I said, God, you know what? You know how to make things work out. I said, I, you know how to make this. This is a test for me. I said, I'm not going to do it. I said, I will raise it to the administration, whatever it takes, but I'm not going to do it. Sabbath came. We were two of us. We decided, you know what, God? This is not easy. And I know, let me tell you, obeying God, I preached here before, requires courage. Others will tell you sometimes, this doesn't make sense. But I say, God doesn't have to make sense. God himself is sense. Whatever you do, you obey God. Later on, you see how God will bless. I said, you know what? This is not going to happen. I am committed to God. And I didn't do it. So we were supposed to do two tests for the final. That's it. That class has only two tests. I didn't do the first one. I had to do the second one. So I went back to the administration. They talked to the teacher and said, you know what? No, you don't need to give a test on Saturday. You can give it another day. So I had only one chance in that class. I had only one chance because I only had to do one test. That test was the, whatever I will get was to be averaged. And I will tell you that sometimes when God does things, when you are faithful, you look back even now sometimes I get teary because somehow God guided me on what I needed to study. This teacher was adamant because I, he felt that I was challenging his authority. And he thought I would bring the hardest test because the first one, those who passed, they only needed a little bit to get over. But he wanted me to fail because I challenged his authority. So he thought on how to bring the hardest test that we would ever think about. Somehow, in my revision, I have no idea, but God guided me step by step. You know, one, I remember thinking, we have studied these things, but we haven't studied this one. But something told me, just read here. Just keep reading. And I will tell you, I studied outside what was even studied. He decided to bring things that he had not even completed in class. Outside. But he said, you know, those things when the teacher comes and says, you know, guys, make sure you read this by yourself. Most people concentrated on the notes that were given. Somehow God guided me to study the places that he only said, study this. And I want to tell you, when the exam came, I was grateful. Because I was scoring high and high as you can imagine. Almost 90. The next person had 47. The next person, I, be, somehow it was not me. Because I cried and I said, God, please don't ashamed me. Please. 
when they did an average, I still was <laughs> somewhere in between with little assignment. I still passed the class. But I want to say this. James is saying, if you really believe God, let it be known on how you walk with God. If you are growing, if you are a person who believes God, if people were to convict you of a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? Think about it. If you people were to convict you as a Christian, I know we have lawyers here. If they were compiling, filing a case so that they can stand, you know, to prosecute you, will they find enough evidence to say, well, when I look at him, and when I look at the template of a Christian, I truly believe this one, the verdict is, he's a Christian. She is a Christian. Sometimes we say, we have faith, but I think sometimes we have faith in the dollar. We say, in God we trust, but sometimes I think we say, in the dollar we trust. Because sometimes how you live shows what is important in our lives. James gives an example of Abraham, and he says, Abraham believed God. But just in case you say, Abraham is just a man who is just up there, who was righteous, and you wonder. Then he gives another example and says, let me give you the example of Rahab. Do you know Rahab? Who was Rahab? Rahab was a deaconess, right? He was an elder in church, right? The Bible says Rahab was who? Was a prostitute. A prostitute who believed God. But not only believing God, but he acted with the faith that he believed God. What did he do? When he saw, when, he, when she had the spies, the Bible says she hid them because she believed they were men of God and did according to what God could have desired her. The Bible says it was accounted for her righteousness, just like Abraham. So in the end, it is not the prostitute Rahab. In the end, it's not the patriarch Abraham. It is faith that moves us to act, that saves us. Let me finish by saying here, when you are faced with a difficult situation, do you talk about the faithfulness of God? How do you show the faithfulness of God? Or maybe you're going through dark times. Faith in dark places. How do you show your faith during the dark times? James will say, faith without works is dead. We are not saved by works, but we are saved for what? For works. As I finish, I love to um, read this passage here. Um, in the book of Ma Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verses 16. The Bible says, Let your light shine before others. Let your light shine before others. That means it's not just in your house. But it says, So that they may see what? Your good works. And what do what? And give glory to your Father in heaven. The Bible says, if you are a child of God, live in a way that you show. Actually, the original Greek word in glorify says, let your light shine before others so that they may see good, your good works and give a proper opinion about God. Live your life so that when people see you, they may give a proper opinion about who? About God. In other words, live in a manner that when people see you, they will see the light of Christ that is lived in you. Final question. Which is your faith? 
honest. Dead faith, demonic faith, or saving faith? Saving faith is the one that moves from the text and goes to action. Saving faith is the one which says, brother is in need, I don't feel sorry and just give a dollar. I just want to be part of how I can help them. You know, sometimes we quiet our mental curiosity and guiltiness by just giving a dollar and giving something. No, real faith is the one which puts on, you know, shoes and hands and goes to action. Jamie says, if you believe in God, then let's see how your faith changes who you are. Remember the, the Bible says the fruit of the spirit, right? Talks about the fruit of the spirit. How do you know a fruit? By, you know the fruit by the, 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 you know the tree by the fruits that it produces. A good tree will produce what? Good fruits. And a bad tree will produce what? Good, but, but you cannot plant an orange and expect apples. He says, by your fruits. And what are the fruits? It's not programs. Fruits is not programs. Fruits is not church attendance. He says, by your fruits. How do we know your fruits? Think and read the Bible. It is what comes from inside. Patience, kindness, love, those are fruits. Some of us, like, the truth is we are not patient, we are not loving, we are angry, we are bitter, we are everything else that you can think about except the fruits of the Spirit. The Bible says your faith is dead if it does not produce the fruits. Maybe it's time that we re-examine ourselves. When people look at you, how you carry yourself, who you are, will they say, when I look at this one, this is a child of God. When I see how he's acting, when I see how she's acting, this is a child of God. Faith is not just something in our heart. It's something that is lived out. If you say you love God, there's nothing you're involved with God then you don't have God. If you say you are not of the world, but three quarters you are in the world, you are embracing the world, you are living like the world, then James will say that is what? Dead faith. Because faith must produce what? Works. Your belief must affect how you behave. Your belief must affect what you do. Your belief must affect how you carry yourself. I pray that God will help us to have the saving faith. So that next time when we come, when people will ask what I asked me here before, most Christians are, we will hear good adjectives. Challenge you. How does your neighbor talk about you? Don't go too far away. How, does your, how do your children talk about you? Don't go too far away. How do the people in school talk about you? If they had to feel that, they say, Fernandez is. James, George, Jane is. What will be the adjective they will put there? It's my prayer. But whatever we put there will be saving faith. Let's pray. Father who is in heaven, we thank you today. Thank you for the word. And Father, I know that sometimes we struggle. But I pray that you help us, Lord, that we can have faith that is lived for others to glorify you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior. Let's stand to our feet. that faith faith that poor Jesus walks for your glory help us Lord so that Lord when others see us may give you glory and honor for what you have done in our lives dear Lord forgive us Father wherever we may have misrepresented you falsely. Father, wherever we may have been hypocrites, forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to search ourselves, Lord. Father, search us, Lord. And Father, be with us. Transform us for your glory and honor, Lord. As we go away from here, we pray, Lord, May we always be in your presence, Father. We pray that you may guide each and every one of us, Father, 
that, Lord, your will may be manifested by our lives. Dear Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you again for coming. We just want to wish you a happy Sabbath, a blessed day, and may the peace of the Lord be with you until we meet again. Thank you.